Hello, this is Shannon Kleibrink, and you are listening to the Future of Curling Masterclasses presented by Curling Canada with support from the World Curling Federation's Development Assistance Program. In this episode, we explore the difference between price and value, pricing strategies, value propositions, and approaches that will have curlers paying more for their future curling experiences. This masterclass is presented by Kim Dennis. Kim is a two-time British Columbia Curling Club champion, coach developer, and member services manager for Curl BC. Kim is passionate about building the capacity of individuals and organizations to support a culture of inclusion and lifelong participation in curling. Hello, my name is Kim Dennis. I'm the member services manager at Curl BC, and today I'll be discussing price first value. We're really going to explore the concept of price first value and how it relates to planning, implementing, and executing curling related programs and activities to create a winning experience economy in your curling facility. We're going to break down common misconceptions about pricing and leave inspired to make decisions based on economic values and to navigate the market in your community. I'm gonna start off with an unpopular opinion, uh, but let's face it, curling is too cheap. And I know that's unpopular, and it's one that we've created through our established systems and mindset in how we approach offering curling in our communities. So as soon as this phrase leaves my mouth, I bet you're thinking, we can't raise our prices because of X. Our current members will be outraged. People will stop playing and seniors have fixed income. We've always priced it this way. Well, second unpopular opinion, just because you've always done something that way, doesn't mean you should continue to do it moving forward. Curling is not a commodity. Curling is an experience. Uh, It's not a commodity because we're not gas, we're not groceries. We are building a community where people come into our facilities for social connections, to participate in sport, or even just to have a cup of coffee. So keep this in mind when you're looking at um, the strategies that you're gonna use and the market that you're looking for, um, and let's stop treating curling as a commodity. Okay, so I'd like to share a story about curling club nachos with you. So my ladies curling team, we love to have post-game nachos after our games. It is our favorite thing. We look forward to it every single week. And one year we got a new chef in our curling club. And he went in and, you know, our nachos were traditionally always $10. And all of a sudden the price of cheese went up, the price of toppings went up. And instead of, you know, making some changes, he decided that in order to stay within that $10 price range, that he would substitute in different ingredients. So instead, one week we order these nachos and all of a sudden we're getting rubbery cheese. They're not layered. There's only a few toppings sprinkled on top. There's broken chips. It was really inconsistent. Um, And honestly, we didn't want to eat it. So this went on for a few weeks and then eventually by the end of the season, we weren't ordering nachos anymore. Next season comes around and we have a new chef. And this new chef also had a love for nachos. And so what we found is all of a sudden, You know, we were getting these nicely layered nachos. There was cheese in three different layers. It was full of toppings. All of a sudden it was coming with salsa and sour cream. And the price of the nachos went up. They were closer to like $15. But you can bet that our team went back every single week because we were getting this beautiful plate of nachos instead of getting these like this rubbery pile of broken chips from the season before. So I just wanted to share that story because when we start talking about price versus value, sometimes we feel like we get boxed into something we've always had or fearful that if we do increase something that people will stop buying it. But in this case, I hope you feel inspired that um, offering a better quality product will actually end up uh, serving your membership better and it might start bringing a few more people uh, into your into your kitchens. So I have a little quote for you. Um, Price is what you pay, value is what you get. And so I want you to let those words sink in. So I'm gonna say it one more time for you here today. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. We confuse these two words or believe that they can mean the same thing. So I'd like to unpack uh, a few other terms that we may have heard while we're sitting around our curling tables or in meetings with our boards. Uh, but I want to unpack with you too expensive. 
because we've really allowed this statement and our literal and oversimplistic interpretation of this to drive too many decisions in our curling facilities. So I'd like us to think about changing our narrative. So when it comes to facing those pricing questions as the decision makers in our curling organizations, it is important to step back and unpack what too expensive means. What does that really mean to the person who is saying it? So for example, you know, if I look at a picture of a Ferrari and someone says, oh, that's too expensive. Well, that's a pretty relative statement because a Ferrari may be too expensive for me, but it's not too expensive for someone like Beyonce. So the phrase is relative. Um, and I just want us to think about the nuance that, that brings along with it too, because we start thinking about nuances like, oh, it's like too expensive. So for example, um, I'm a mom of three kids. One of my kids has started playing hockey and I never expected to become a hockey mom. And when you come from a, a curling background, sometimes people are like, oh, you play hockey? Like that's too expensive. So that phrase is a little bit nuanced. So we compare it, uh, so we compare things. So for someone, um, hockey might be too expensive for them. But when I look at the value that the, it brings to my kid in participating, the amount of times that he gets to go on the ice, the hoodie that he gets, the team camaraderie, the mental health that comes along with that, um, those things are valuable to me. So it does depend on who your audience is and who you're speaking to. So it is good to be aware and digging in a little bit more to find out what too expensive really means to the audience that you're speaking with. When we hear too expensive, is what we hear is this offer costs more money than the market is able to pay. And what it actually means is this costs more money than I am willing to pay. So these two very similar looking statements have entirely different meanings. What we choose to hear is an economic statement, but what people more often are trying to communicate is their own value statement. So too expensive can sometimes mean that the economic realities of the majority in a community does not permit the level of price being charged to be changed despite what the offer is. So the next time you enter the too expensive conversation, be curious and ask questions to determine if it is the cost, the time or effort that is really the barrier to the potential customers in your community. Find out what the individual means when they say something is too expensive. Too often we equate it as too much money, which drives more decisions and barriers to how we price and offer curling activities in our communities. One of my favorite quotes comes from Danny Lamoureux, and that one that I heard in 2019 at a Business of Curling symposium was, new curlers don't know that they're supposed to be cheap. Our traditions, our history, and our past have created that perspective and those that haven't played or didn't grow up in a curling family have no idea what it used to be like or what was charged or how something was done. So the, these new people coming into our curling communities, uh, this is your opportunity to explore what your price market value would look like because they have nothing to compare it to other than other sporting experiences that they may have encountered in your community. So too expensive may not be financially related in those conversations. Um, your opportunity may be asking for too much time or too much effort. Um, you know, is it too much time? How easy is it to get to your curling club? Um, how much volunteer time is expected of someone when they show up or they're gonna be registering? What other little nuances uh, are happening when someone is looking at participating in the activities or your programs that you have. So I'd like to go through um, digging in a little bit more into economic values. All right, so I'm gonna take a page out of Josh Kaufman's book, The Personal MBA 10th Anniversary Edition. And he looks at nine economic values, which are really important for our curling facilities to be thinking about when we start to transition away from thinking that what we have is a commodity and turning it into a winning curling experience. So of the nine economic examples, the first one I'd like to talk about is efficacy. How well does it work? If you were to throw the same line, the same weight and rotation to the same broom, does a rock travel to the same place down the ice every single time? 
The next economic value I'd like you to consider is speed. You know, the old model of mentoring a new curler is a front end player for 10 years before they get to play a new position or try to be third or second or skip. It's way too slow. We need to shorten up the learning curve. So how can you introduce something like instruction in order to increase the speed at which someone is going to learn our sport, feel more involved in our sport, and then want to bring somebody new along? Reliability. Can I depend on it to do what I want? Once they have paid their registration fee online, walk through the doors, they have that warm welcome in the first week because everybody's excited it's the start of the curling season. But can they expect that same warm welcome in atmosphere from week to week? Will they still receive that in week number two or week number five or even halfway through the season? You know, an example uh, that we heard, I've heard time again is uh, people don't buy the drill, they buy the hole. People are looking for the solution to a need that they're trying to fill or something that they want to do. So something to consider when you're looking at your next marketing campaign or next program at your activity, uh, look at the community around you. How can you fit the need of those individuals in your community? Ease of use. How much effort does it require? Is it easy to register? Is it easy to learn? Is it easy to get customer support? Uh, how easy can you join a league? Or did you miss that, you know, Wednesday night at seven o'clock, first week paper registration form, and all of a sudden you're out of luck because you couldn't make it there at, you know, five o'clock or seven o'clock, whatever it is. Um, how do you expect someone like myself, who is an active mom of three kids, working a full-time career, to be able to make your one-time registration deadline I'm the type of person that if I can't find you on my phone or on my PC at 10 o'clock at night when I'm in my PJs and I have some downtime, I'm likely not registering for a program or activity that you're offering. Flexibility, how many things does it do? We're really lucky in curling that we have so many examples of the things that curling has to offer or the things our curling spaces have to offer. We've got physical health, social health, mental health, daytime use, evening use, you can use curling as an individual, you can do it as a team, it's something you can access in the winter. Uh, for those that um, have their spaces or operate their summertime uses as well, you know, we're seeing a lot of clubs being creative in what they can do with their spaces, even in their off season. I've seen pickleball, darts championships, I've seen stamp shows, trade shows, flea markets, um, you know, and then in the winter time, you see team building, you see, you know, people bringing out a group of friends and having some fun yelling the curling terms down the ice. So we're really lucky that our sport and our spaces have a lot of flexibility and we can really start pumping up those opportunities uh, to the communities around us. Another ac economic value to consider is status. How is this going to affect the way that others perceive me or see me? So when you're building your programs or your activities, something you may wanna consider is what equipment are you going to provide to those new people coming into your programs? If I was to come in and as part of my registration fee, I get your club hoodie and you hand me a broom and a couple of grippers to put on my rental shoe, I'm already gonna feel like I'm part of the crew. I'm, I look like one of your members. So when I go on the ice and somebody walked in, they wouldn't be able to separate me out from somebody who's been curling for over 10 years. On the flip side, if you have a registration, you're like, okay, well, we'll give you the rental broom and we've got our rental grippers and I go out on the ice and everything that I'm either using or accessing says rental all over it, uh, it's gonna be pretty easy to pick out that I'm somebody new in your club versus feeling like you're already treating me like a member. So something else when it comes to thinking about how the status reflects in curling as well is using a stick. So we do have the sticks that people can use and often I see that's a last resort for someone. So someone's come out for their rental, you know, they've tried the traditional slide, they've tried a delivery aid, they've tried a broom and it's not working for them. Or you can tell they just seem a little too nervous to wanna to sit down in the hack or maybe they don't have the ability to sit down in the hack. 
And all of a sudden it's like, well, you can't do it this way, so here's a stick. So think about that customer experience that instead of waiting until someone can't do something, consider giving everybody in the group a stick to try something first so that everybody's given it a try, everyone's comfortable on the ice, and then go into some different, um, into the different options. So now someone feels like right off the get-go, they're already a curler. They're already feeling like, oh, like, yeah, I'm part of the group. And it's not necessarily I'm being singled out because I can't do something. The seventh economic value is aesthetics. How attractive or otherwise pleasing is this going to look? We live in a very Instagrammable world. When somebody walks into their, your facility, what place are they going to be looking for to be like, oh, that's where I want to take my next Instagram photo. If your club is bright and open and you got music going on, maybe there's a fun mural or there's just even a cool poster sitting on the walls. Um, people are gonna get excited about those things and we want them to be excited because then they're gonna post it and they're going to share that experience. On the other side though, if your club has, you know, last night's party garbage overflowing, you know, there's a wet floor sign still sitting over by the door, that's going to influence the way in which people see your community space and that's going to make a difference on whether or not they come back. Two more to go, here we go. So the eighth economic value is emotion. How does this make me feel? And this one probably sits a little closer to home with myself because I still feel the same way stepping into an arena from the first time I tried curling. I can remember the first time that I opened the doors to step out on the ice and when that cold air hit me, I just felt like I was home. So emotion is another area in which we can we can tie in and bring people back, like give them that feeling of like, that space at their home and they're comfortable and this is where they want to be. The last economic value on the list in Josh Kaufman's book is cost. And I want you to think about cost in terms of how much do I have to give up in order to get this? So if you think about it, it's not just money, it's your time, it's your effort. In order for me to curl, you know, I have to think about childcare, who's gonna watch my kids so that I can go on the ice? what other activities are going on. Um, time is very important as well. Do individuals, are they working because they have to bring in a second income? So maybe someone is working two jobs in order to get through. So how can we find ways or spaces in order to create something that will work for them and meet the, meeting them where they're at? So overall, the next time you're sitting down in your boardroom or you're having a beer around your curling club and you're trying to figure out what that next experience is, I want you to leave the discussion about cost for last. So instead of saying, we want everybody to charge 50 bucks. And so what are, how can we build a program that's gonna fit $50? What I want you to think about are those other values. So efficacy, speed, reliability, ease of use, flexibility, status, aesthetics, and emotion, and then put a cost on it. To give someone that true curling experience, put in all of those things and then figure out what it would take to bring that to life. So now that we've talked about these values, how do we put them together to create this winning experience economy? So emerging generations are more minimalist. They would rather enjoy the moments that we have rather than like accumulating a lot of stuff. So there's a greater desire for those experience over materials, which bodes really well for a curling business moving forward. Individuals are valuing time more than money. Time is going to be our primary currency of emerging generations. And for those of you that like it, you only live once. So bring that to the table that if, I only have one opportunity for this person to come out and try curling. I want it to be the best opportunity because I want them to tell their friends. I want them to come back for their birthday party in a year from now. Even if they're a one-time curler a year, you know, give them that experience and you'll have them as a customer for life. So I want us to go back a few years and I might be dating myself here, but there was one year my mom took us for a drive on Boxing Day because I originally came from a small town, we moved to a city, and it was something that we had never seen before. And so what happened was we jump in the car, we're driving around, and 
we're seeing that people are in sleeping bags, sleeping outside these stores because they had some big Boxing Day sales coming up the next day. And I just remember being floored by the fact that, you know, people felt the need that like they had to be there to be either the one to either get the really good deal or because it was something that they had to have. And if they weren't there, they weren't going to get it and they were going to miss out on it. So how do we take something like that and bring that to our curling clubs? Like, how do we create and evoke that emotion of like, I don't want to miss out on this registration. I don't want to be on the white list this season because I want to be there for your six pack Friday league where you've got everybody gets a beer and music's blaring on the ice. And if I don't register, I'm not going to get in. So in looking at that winning experience, I want your decision makers, instead of asking themselves, how do we make curling more affordable for people and trying to box ourselves into this too expensive mindset, we should re really be asking ourselves, how do we create a curling experience so grand that people are sitting there and they're waiting for it to open? So a winning ex curling experience really looks like awesome ice conditions, a variety of selection in your lounges. And I'm not just talking alcoholic beverages either. There's a lot of non-alcoholic options that are really cool and fun. So look into different things. Something I've already heard this weekend is some clubs are going to do some relegation with their, with their beers and their, and their wines. And it's like, all right, the top two votes, these ones are going to stay. And then they're going to bring in something new, um, building those partnerships with your local um, restaurants and local businesses as well to do promotions and keeping it fun and just giving people something that they know they can expect from week to week as well will really help create that fun environment that you're looking for that you want people talking about as they go back into their communities or as they go back to work or back to school or whatever their next activity of the day is going to be. So now that we've kind of gone through uh, that curling is an experience, uh, some ways in which we can think about creating that value experience for your customer, um, the next thing I'd like to dig into a little bit is our pricing strategies. So I'd like to look at the choose to strategy. If you had to decide between providing, between price, quality, and service, and you could only pick two, which two would you choose? Would you choose price and quality, but you're sacrificing your service? Would you select price and service, but sacrifice your quality? Or would you choose service and quality and sacrifice price? So take a moment to just think about that. Now I'm hoping that you would have chosen option three as your primary one because providing quality service time after time um, is where we want to be. So if your tendency was to go for, well, yeah, I want someone to have really great service or I want to receive really great service as a consumer and yeah, I really appreciate good quality, then why are we always going back to this idea of we're talking, we're focusing on price? If so, if that wasn't your tendency here, why does that always show up as your focus in some of your conversations? So just bring some awareness to that when you do go into your next board meeting or into your next staff meeting and say, hey, like, let's back up a little bit here. What are we trying to offer? Yeah. And if this is what's meaningful to us, this is where we want to start in creating this. So next unpopular opinion of the day when it comes to pricing strategies, I want us to stop with discounts, especially with your introductory customers. These are your new people. They have no expectations of what things were or what things should be. We need to stop saying devaluing ourselves from the very beginning. So I want us to stop giving our introductory curlers discounts. The definition of a discount is actually to minimize the importance of. So when we're trying to grow our customer base, we're trying to bring new people in, why are we already giving the perception that we have to discount something for them to come in and participate? These are the people that don't have any expectations. They have nothing con to compare to. So let's stop selling ourselves short by thinking that we have to advertise that this is a special in order to get someone through the door. Digital payments. This is a huge opportunity for curling. 
people have impulse buying habits. They want it to be convenient. Some people don't even walk around with a wallet anymore. They, their cards are on their phone. So how, easy, how can we use technology to our advantage to start tapping into some of these impulse buys as it comes through someone's screen? It's like, scan here to book your next curling lesson. Like, yeah, I'm in, this sounds like fun when I'm sitting there with a group of friends. So really lean into technology and digital payments being our friends instead of being afraid of like, oh, we've never used it before. How is this gonna work? You might tap into a whole new market that you're really missing out on. Okay, so I know you're sitting here and we're talking about increasing prices, increasing our value, and barrier to entry is probably something sitting in the back of your mind right now. So yes, price can be a barrier to entering our sport or entering our activities or programs, but we cannot fill from an empty cup. So if our cups are empty, we're not going to be able to offer these winning experiences for people, but there are different strategies that we can use to still be able to offer curling uh, to individuals where price may be a barrier. So something I want us to think about is we don't have to be everything to everyone. So we can have different groups that we can be servicing and we can maybe change our prices depending on which group we're servicing or who our target audience is. So something to keep in mind if you are thinking about raising prices, maybe it's not just a blanket raise everywhere or maybe you're just going to consider raising the prices with one group and kind of see how it goes and see what kind of feedback you get or maybe you're even gonna grow the number of people that are gonna register because you are offering them more and you're showing your value. And they're like, yeah, this sounds like a really fun experience. I'm gonna get a hoodie, I'm gonna get a, some lessons. This sounds like a lot of fun. So ways in which we can battle the barriers to entry is we can consider having different pricing strategies. So something that we can take advantage of or look as an area of opportunity when it comes to barriers to entry. Um, historically, our curling seasons, they start September to October, and we ask everybody to pay for their entire season upfront. Well, I can tell you now as a young mom of three kids, I've just paid for my back to school. I am looking at all of my kids' sports. Um, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at my own sports to participate in, and that's a big month. Like September is a massive month in my household. And so I'm privileged enough to be able to plan ahead and have that aside, but that might not be the reality for everyone. So something to consider would be, you know, can you have a payment plan pricing? So I'll, instead of paying for my entire season in one go, maybe I pay by month so I can, sign up as a member every single month. And if it works for me that month, great. If not, I have the option to sign up in a couple months from now or in the following month, or even considering looking at drop-in fees. So we need to be creative with the ways in which we can offer our programming and the ways that people can pay for programming and giving them different opportunities. So this gives them the option to choose what works best for them and it'll still get them coming through our doors even if it's not in the way that we've traditionally run our businesses. Other ways that we can decrease that barrier to entry is to partner with other local groups where they're looking to support participation. So programs like Kids Sport, there are people out there raising money to help support kids participating. So have some conversations, find out what you can do in order to partner with them, to help build up your programs. You're engaging more individuals in your communities and everybody, kids is a giant focus for organizations. So if you're looking to grow your youth members, why not find somebody who is already doing that work and then leveraging that so that you're growing opportunities for both of your organizations. So looking at um, organizations, even like Jumpstart, there is a reason that there are grant programs out there that are focused on engaging youths, youth, youth so seniors, uh, immigrants new to Canada. So if those are individuals that are currently missing in your community spaces, find those organizations where they are wanting to support those individuals and find something, build up those partnerships so then you're both leveraging and reaching a goal together. 
So don't feel like you always need to start from ground zero in order to bring a program or activity to life. Find something that's gonna align with your vision, your mission, and your goals for the upcoming season and find somebody else who has those similar ones. So we've learned that the volunteer landscape is changing. So what if participants had the option to volunteer in-kind hours for services that you need around the club instead of just using money. So someone can volunteer their time to help with ice making, or maybe it's helping with bartending or running your youth program because someone has really great energy. So there are ways that you can engage with your community members and you're creating value for them. They're gonna feel valued for the skill set that they're bringing into your club and they're gonna feel valued by you. And then you're gonna feel valued that people are wanting to come in and donate that time to you as well. So give yourself some new opportunities, try something new. If it doesn't work the first time, that's fine. Try it again or find out like, oh, maybe we need to just make a couple of little tweaks to really knock this out of the park. So give yourself an opportunity to have little iterations and don't wait till the end of the season. You know, really check in with people that are coming into your spaces or go out into the community, go to a community event and set up a booth. And when you're talking about your club and what you have to offer and someone's like, oh, I'm not sure if it's for me, like ask them questions and be curious. Like, why isn't this for you? Like, why don't you think this is for you? Um, and sometimes you might be surprised on what the answers are because you might've been making assumptions that are way off base. So if I can leave you with anything on thinking about pricing and value, it's be curious, try something new and have some fun with it. And if it doesn't work the first time, don't be afraid to fail fast and move on to that next idea that you're gonna knock out of the park and be brave being that unpopular person in the room.